Bloom is brought to you by the members of WCNY. Thank you. Toxic algae is definitely a new problem. Since I was growing up, we never had any outbreaks, at least none that I ever knew anything about. And since the 2017 flood, there have been a few down here. When it's there, it's pretty nasty. You can't go swimming. Um, you know, have to make sure your pets stay out of the water. It definitely has changed sort of how we feel about summers. We have been dealing with harmful algal blooms in freshwater resources for a while. In 2014, I want to take you back to what happened in Lake Erie, one of the largest blooms that we had seen, and it disrupted the drinking water supply for the city of Polito. The microcystis was so thick that they had to shut down the drinking water intakes in Lake Erie. And so that is all the public water coming into a community, so no showering, no you know, washing dishes. Um, you had to be careful what was used from the tap. But what happened is the chemistry inside of the metabolism of the lake changed. So the loading levels that we were hitting before, like the limits on the nutrients, were being met. But the lake was responding differently. So that our management styles had to change dramatically. And so fast forward to 2017, we saw very similar hot weather patterns, intensive storm that brought in loading of materials that carry phosphorus, so that's like your manure soils that then contributed to um, fueling a large algal uh, growth. Those are the two nutrients that you need, phosphorus and nitrogen in, in the Finger Lake system. Um, probably the more important one is phosphorus because it's so scarce. If you look at the ratios of phosphorus to nitrogen, there's more than enough nitrogen. You'll use up the available phosphorus first. So then when you're tracking which nutrient you need to then support a bloom, you're starting to measure phosphorus. Now harmful algal blooms aren't always toxic, but they can be. So they're cyanobacteria that can produce the microcystin toxin. Cyanobacteria are photosynthetic organisms. So that's one of the things, they're bacteria. Uh, they're also commonly known as blue-green algae. They're some of the oldest living organisms on Earth, three and a half billion years old. So they are thought to be responsible for bringing oxygen into the environment of Earth. Cyanobacteria's claim to fame is that they produce toxins. Some of the toxins, all you do is get a skin rash. Other toxins will give you diarrhea and other gastrointestinal problems. But the third type of toxins are, are neurotoxins. And, and those toxins, you can actually die if you get a high enough dose. We are looking here at some lake samples from the Finger Lakes and looking at the cyanobacteria that are present. We see a lot of microcystis here. And one of the things that you'll notice about the microcystis is these are colonial forms. So they're much harder to ingest by zooplankton and other filter feeders. And another key feature of them is that they can float on the surface. So they have gas vacuoles where they can move up and down in the water column. And once they start to grow very quickly, they can shade out other competing phytoplankton. Owasco Lake was the first Finger Lake to have a recognized bloom back in 2016, but what is causing it now to bloom? So this is where the scientists and the researchers are helping us identify what has changed. People were particularly surprised when Skinny Atlas Lake experienced a cyanobacteria outbreak, and that's because of the character of the lake and its water chemistry and so on, and that really signaled to folks that 
our situation has changed, that we can't take uh, this water quality for granted anymore. And that's particularly important in Skinny Atlas because it is the unfiltered drinking water supply for Syracuse. The other lakes are used for public water supplies, but all that water is filtered before it goes into people's homes. Harmful algal blooms, whether they're toxic or not, impact our water quality in the Finger Lakes. It limits swimming, it limits fishing. If the harmful algal bloom is impacting the depths of water supply intakes, it can, that can be a management uh, opportunity that, that folks have to do to treat that water. It's an estimated one to one and a half million people that utilize the water of the Finger Lakes as public water supply. Worst case scenario is what we're doing right now, is figuring out if nothing is done, do nothing. The picture I'm gonna paint for you is pretty sad. It's gonna be really Really, really hot, we won't have a place to go swimming, we won't have a place to get water, we're going to have to spend even more money for treatment or look for alternative water supplies and it's going to impact businesses and our quality of life. I like to think of the watershed as a bowl, and the lip of the bowl are the hills, and water runs downhill. And when it rains, you only get the water that you get in your bowl, in your watershed. That's what you have to work with. It was a really an epiphany, and I love this, for us to realize the concept of a watershed, because before that, people didn't know where the clouds ended or how much water they had to work with, and it was all done on just political boundaries. Once we knew that there was a watershed, it defined who your partners were, who your neighbors were the key stakeholders that had to work together, not based on politics, it's who's in the bowl that has to share the water with you. Getting back to the concept of a watershed, it doesn't just determine the quantity of water you have to work with, it determines the quality because when it's falling from the sky, it's pretty much pure H2O. But as it flows through that watershed, the landscape, it's picking stuff up, dissolved stuff. Some of it's natural, like uh, dissolved limestone, but it also picks up things that humans have added to the landscape. And in the case of septic systems and fertilizers for your lawn or farm fields where we add fertilizers and manure, we spread manure and we add pesticides through all that landscape. The water as it moves through that watershed, it's picking up all these things that then make the water unhealthy for humans or for fish and organisms that live there. We've got rid of the trees and the vegetation in many places. The soil is not nice and organic with leaves and all. We've, now it's very mineral, so there's not that sponge to absorb the water. To reduce the water coming in, you want to reduce the speed, not the quantity, but the speed. And you want to slow it down over time and you want to let it soak in so it gets that benefit of the natural filtration. We can take really strong management efforts to reduce the nutrients that are flowing in and the disruption that they cause for our regular daily lives. If the water is carrying nutrients off your farm, it's not doing your crops any good. Twinbirds dairy, and we're primarily a dairy farm. We grow the crops to feed the dairy, and we produce about 44 million pounds of milk a year. We'd rather harvest the nutrients through our crops and put it back through the cows. Normally, this would all be bare ground, but we've got the wheat as a cover crop, the cover crop planted, and the roots, you can see how that roots really got to hold the ground. And that helps hold it and keeps it out of the water, out of the lake. It's providing there's a lot more root system than you see on top. Otherwise, the soil would just be loose. If it was bare like this, it would just be loose and could run, and could run away when the snow melts off or when it rains hard. Soil health is the foundation of everything that we do in the watershed. Soil health is, is our soil's ability to have organic matter and microorganisms to be the bigger, better sponge to absorb those storm events that we get on a very regular basis. If it's running soil off our farm, that, that's a valuable resource. We only get one chance at it.
the key piece were these things that we didn't ever think about, and that's the roadside ditch, the depression that runs on both sides of every road. These roadside ditches have been capturing runoff. The problem is that they don't just capture runoff from the road. In many cases, what happens is there's a hill adjacent to the roadside ditch, like this one. So when water runs off of that land, it goes into the ditch. When that rain occurs, that water comes down this hill, is intercepted by the ditch, and it chunked it rapidly downslope. The majority of these ditches capture about a quarter of all the runoff in all the studies we've done in New York State. We're worried about nutrients coming off of the watershed, going into the lakes, and con maybe contributing to the toxic algal blooms. Not all the reasons are clear yet why we're now getting HABs, whereas we didn't before, but nutrients seem to be a part. I think it's really important for us to avoid the tendency to point and blame one entity. It's a collective societal issue and it requires a comprehensive and sophisticated societal response. And we've done this before, it's doable. We just have to double down and adapt to the new metabolism of our finger lakes. August of 2021, we had back-to-back -back storms, or actually two separate flooding events. You know, I was out of town. We had actually just flown to visit a child who's now living in Chicago, and as we arrived, I was getting phone calls and pictures from my neighbors about a flood. So I wasn't actually here for the event, but I was certainly here for the aftermath. As happened in 2017. So much water came down that the water brought down tree trunks and limbs and rocks and all sorts of debris, which again jammed up the bridge over the road. And as soon as the bridge jammed up, water went everywhere. A lot of yards were ripped out and destroyed. Actually, that, a lot of that still even hasn't, hasn't been repaired even yet. Our real trauma from the 2017 flood was in the, I guess I'd call them flood control measures that we put in, basically a flood wall around the um, outside of our house to, again, hopefully catch the water in the event of a future flood. That was pretty pricey, and flood insurance doesn't cover that kind of a loss, so it was basically on our dime that we did all that. How much are we talking? Honestly, about 80,000 bucks. The Finger Lakes is a small region compared to the globe, but actually the, the Finger Lakes really kind of mirrors the types of impacts of climate change, the changes in climate that most places around the earth have seen. I would put the first thing on there is just the, the warming of average temperatures, particularly the warming of average temperatures in the winter. I think the other thing is on the precipitation side of things, really been an increase in extreme rainfall. You know, if we look at our average rainfall across the year, it's gone up, it's gone up by give or take a few percentages. What has changed is the character in which that rainfall comes. But we're also seeing higher rainfall intensities. So it's, it's, it's the fact that when it rains on a particular day, it rains more on those days than it did if we spread that out over a lot of days. Storms absolutely have gotten worse over the course of certainly my lifetime. You know, we seem not to have quite as many huge snowstorms than what I remember as a kid. We also never used to get four inches of rain in an hour or two. Like in Hurricane Agnes in 1972, I think it was, that definitely was flooding down in this area, but we have not had things like we've had the last few years. The last rain bomb we had, it made a pier going out into the water that uh, was probably 40 or 50 feet long and the dock was 
buried right, under, right underneath all the shale that had washed into the lake. Back in 2021, as we look at the water gauge of Owasco Lake, it rose more than two feet. It was almost up to 715 feet above sea level. I approached our highway superintendent of the dollar amounts that are associated with fixing the mess after a flood. With one site, it was $32,000 just to fix one area that got washed out from that rain bomb event that we had in 2021. If we look at the effect of climate on the Finger Lakes, on the cytobacteria, if there are nutrients or contaminants on the landscape, flood events and increase in runoff is, is one mechanism where, where those nutrients or contaminants can, can make it into other water bodies. The water can't soak into the ground and therefore it, it runs across the surface and, and carries the nutrients with it. The cytobacteria generally do better in warmer water conditions. As we warm the lakes, there's more opportunity for them to develop and go through their life cycles in, in bloom. Another aspect there is the overturning of lakes. Lakes in the Finger Lakes will overturn uh, twice a year in the spring and the fall, and that kind of mixes up the lakes and things along those lines. It stratifies the surface, and that kind of keeps the nutrients kind of concentrated in where the, the cytobacteria would need them. The flooding events that we've had in the last few years and the probability that there will be more flooding events as the future unfolds, uh, you know, we certainly have thought about just bailing out, literally bailing out and going elsewhere, um, but this place is too close to my heart. On the 22nd, what we're going to be doing is looking at the densities of zebra mussels and quagga mussels along a number of transects. Eventually, the idea is to compare the densities between the two. They are native to what they call the Ponto-Caspian region. In the 1980s, people first started noticing in the Great Lakes that we were getting some of these invasive mussels. They could also travel on people's recreational vessels to places like the Finger Lakes. Zebra mussels tend to atta attach to plants that you might see in the lake or to rocky surfaces, and quagga mussels prefer soft sediment. And then we also have recently been trying to figure out if they have had played a role in the development of some of the cyanobacterial blooms that have been increasing recently as well. All summer, you have everything that's being produced in the lake sort of sinking to the bottom as it dies and nutrients accumulate there. The zebra and quagga mussels can take algae in and eat them, that's their food, and then they're gonna basically excrete all of that and they can increase the nutrients there. But there's other complicating factors as well. So the quagga mussels that can go deeper onto these soft sediments, they are present and releasing nutrients right near the bottom. And most things can't access that, but some of these big cyanobacteria, they are able to be at the surface in the day and then at night they can go down into that deep water that may be giving these really big colonial cyanobacteria an advantage. If at, at night when they're not photosynthesizing, they basically go and get a midnight snack down at the bottom of the lake by taking up those nutrients that the quagga mussels have released down at the bottom. That's one possible way. Carolyn Underwood is a student, a senior at Syracuse University, and she's doing a project related to Owasco Lakes. And we set up a simple experiment to test this idea. Do the mussels themselves, the quagga mussels that bury in the sediments, would just the presence of the mussels interacting with the sediments release more nutrients? Because that could increase the cyanobacteria. And then we have controls that you're looking at now that don't have any mussels in them. And then we have two treatments that have mussels. One, where there's screening very near the top that prevent the mussels from going more than two centimeters into the sediment. And then one where they can access the whole sediments. And every day, Carolyn comes in and she takes a nutrient sample to see how much nitrogen and phosphorus are being released from the sediment. Sediment without mussels, so that's our control. 
sediment with mussels that can naturally interact with the sediment, and then sediment with mussels that are constrained to just the top treatment. We're really just investigating if they're affecting that sediment water interface. Can we attribute any given bloom to one of these factors? Right now, no, I don't think so. We know all the things that might be contributing, but we really can't say like this algal bloom was definitely due to this factor. We don't, we can't answer that question. Yet. There's a certain resilience and it's commendable to think that we want to do what we can to make sure we can stay here. Sometimes I wonder whether it's just crazy, but <laughs> um, as you say, I do have roots here and it would take a lot to really get me to pick up and move. So yeah, we do what we can. We are in an age of resiliency and that we need to rebuild resiliency into our systems, the way that humans interact with the land and how the land impacts the water based on the way that humans use it. Can we eliminate the risk of harmful algal blooms forever? I can't go that far, but what we can do is reduce it and mitigate it. The DEC has multiple programs to monitor water quality in streams and lakes through our rotating integrated basin studies program. As part of that, we have routine monitoring, long-term monitoring sites at several locations in the state, and we also do monitoring in the watershed via our WAVE program. So that monitoring data in conjunction with uh, things like United States Geological Survey stream gauges weather forecasts inform how we can measure and know what's leaving the landscape and entering our water bodies. And as part of that process, we can take all of that input data and generate water quality models for our watersheds, which are basically computer constructs of how water materials and weather all interact to, to move materials and water from the watersheds into the receiving lakes. an example of a ditch remediation project. You can see there's a lot of sediment in the material in the water here. So what Aula helps fund in this cost sharing effort is the monies we raise are used to pay for the riprap as well as the hydro seeding that we will do. A hydro seed is a slurry of material with actual seed that is sprayed onto the ditch and allows then vegetation to grow, then in the future holds the soil where it belongs. We will be hydro seeding at the end after we get all the gabion stone and stone in the ditches to keep stop the erosion. With everything that goes on here, it'll probably take us close to a month. In the last few years, Aula has raised over $50,000 in this matching grant program that we have with the county. And as we look at the projects that we have helped fund, there's been more than 14 miles of ditch remediation within the watershed. Hemlocks are throughout upstate New York and they play a critical role shading the water and holding the soil in place. In the last 30 years, an invasive pest called the hemlock woolly adelgid has been invading all of our hemlock trees with a very high mortality rate. In a few years, that'll almost all certainly be dead trees. There's a hemlock initiative program down at Cornell University at Ithaca, and with their expertise, we learned all about this infestation. The longer term solution is to grow predator bugs in this area that feed on just the adelgid. Across the 10 year program that we've committed to do is to save as many of these watershed critical hemlocks as we can. The Finger Lakes Land Trust is a nonprofit organization that works cooperatively with landowners and local communities to 
conserve those lands that are really define the character of the region. And increasingly, we're also involved in, in protecting water. This stream over my shoulder here was suffering extreme erosion because how the watershed of the stream had been changed over time. And each year, tons and tons of topsoil were being eroded into the lake, carrying nutrients with them. So we partnered with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and essentially rebuild this small stream, raise the bed of the stream, and then using natural materials, log and rock, carefully place them to lead off the energy that was eroding all the soil and instead start to channel it into a more natural, sinuous pattern. And we're pleased because not only are we dealing with erosion here and addressing that issue, we're doing it in a way that provides and restores that natural habitat. We are making a positive impact. We need to protect the quality of the lake for our drinking water source, and it is the economic base of our community. Our mission is to restore and protect. Bloom is brought to you by the members of WCNY. Thank you.